Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So, um, just to give you some background, so this is um, a new hype beast radio show called mm -hmm. The Business of Hype. It was Kevin and I sort of talking about like what podcasts really need, and the idea that everyone sort of, all of us inspire people to like go out and follow their dreams and quit their day job and do their thing, but then a lot of young people do it, and then I hear like, well, what do I do now? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what are some of the challenges with real logistical stuff, trademarking, legal, banking, like, you know, financing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's where I want to sort of concentrate on, kind of like getting into like the real nitty gritty business side of things, which is a side that like very rarely gets exposed. From Hypebeast Radio, I'm Jeff Staple, and this is The Business of Hype, a show about creative entrepreneurs, brand builders, innovators, and the realities behind the dreams they've built. Yoon An is a polymath, the pure definition of the word. You just can't describe someone like her using one adjective. I first connected with Yoon and her partner Verbal around 10 years ago. I remember we ran into each other at the old Stussy Soho store, the one with the head porter store above it, and we stayed connected ever since. Back then, I thought Yoon was a dope graphic designer. In the early 2000s, graphic design was in an era of crazy Photoshop filters and an explosion of new typefaces. Too many fonts, too many filters. With all these new tools at your disposal, it was hard to stay true to graphic design roots. I was one of those design nerds that spent way too much time adjusting the kerning in a header. And I could tell in five seconds of looking at Yoon's work that she had the same eye for detail. But for Yoon, as the years progressed, graphic design would morph into music packaging, accessory design, jewelry design, and then fashion design. The thing is, the process was a very slow build. Each new skill set was a careful, deliberate layering into the person that Yoon would become. To me, viewing her from afar, it didn't feel like someone trying to do everything all at once. It felt more like, like a martial arts master slowly graduating from one belt to the next. So the release of this episode is timely, because just last week, Yoon was named Dior Ohm's jewelry designer. And coming off news that Virgil Abloh would become Louis Vuitton's new artistic director, this is a groundbreaking moment in fashion. What this means for race, what this means for minorities, what this means for gender empowerment, and what this means for street culture as a whole. What a time to be alive. I do want to start with just some brief background info for the people who might not know you. Um, I think what's really interesting about your story is that it's like, there's a, there's a deep, wide melting pot mm -hmm. of what makes up Yoon and Ambush, right? Like, I think a lot of people see you today and don't realize that, like, cities like Seattle and Boston play a huge part in your, in your upbringing. And, you know, it's not just, like, Tokyo and Paris, but, like, you have this very sort of, like, long journey, yeah. you know? So maybe talk about, like, the very beginning of how, like, you know, Korea and America sort of played a part in your, in your upbringing. My dad was in U.S. Army, so um, I was born in Korea, but because whenever he gets stationed, so we have to move. So we, um, I was born there, but you know, my dad, we had to move to Hawaii. We lived mm. there for a little bit, went back to Korea, and then we went to California, went back to Korea, and then and he um, decided to leave Army, so we settled in Seattle. Mm. So I grew up in Seattle for a little bit, and then went to college in Boston. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, I met Verbal and I was like working as well. And my dream was to go to New York to work as a graphic designer because, mm -hmm. you know, that was all the big publishing houses were. Yeah. But um, around that time, he was like, why don't you just come out to Tokyo to see if you want to, you know, just kind of, you know, you know, test out. Like maybe there's something for you to do. Right. And moving to another country wasn't something that I was like had in mind. Because mm -hmm. for me, it's just like America, you know, like I grew up in the States and I went to school. So it's like for me, it was like, okay, next big step is like making in the big city kind mm -hmm. of thing. But, you know, I was like, why not? You know, I'm still kind of, I guess if things don't work out, I can always come back here. And then I've been stuck. <laughs> so at that point, you consider yourself an American? I still, I, you know, like... I'm Korean, but I, it's funny, like, I have this conversation a lot with a lot of people who kind of grew up in different places. I, I don't know why, maybe we, similar people attract each other or not, but I kind of see myself as an alien. I don't really have home home, oh. you know, because I was never born and raised in one town where, you know, if I go back, like, my still, like, my friends are there, all my family's there. It's like, none of that exists. Yeah. 
even like my parents' families are all like all over the world. Mm-hmm. Like even my family's all over the world. So you're kind of homeless. Yeah, I'm homeless. <laughs> like, but like that's, you know, like when I was a kid, I used to hate it so much mm-hmm. because I moved around so much and I changed school so much that, you know, like I couldn't make friends because yeah. by the time I'm about to become friends with everybody in school, it's like, I gotta go, mm-hmm. you know, right. I, I still feel really lonely because it's just like, okay, what's next? I'm moving again. And I didn't feel like I, um, I didn't want to invest my time, like getting to know people. Cause you kind of knew you would leave. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I That's actually, so sad. <laughs> no, it's not sad because in res- um, retrospect, I feel like it, it was all meant to be because all those times that I spent um, reading about stuff in the libraries or like listening to music and everything. Those are those stuff that's like feeding me right now to the creative work. Alone. Instead exactly. of partying and going yeah. sleeping over friends' house and stuff. Yeah. Right. Like those, because that, you know, you know, people always like, where do you get, you know, inspirations from all mm-hmm. these things? Those are the stuff yeah. that, that the, all those hours I buried myself in the li- public library, right. <laughs> reading all the materials that exist in the library, mu- listening to music, like AM radio, college stations, like digging up old bands and like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I kind of like, you know, it back then used to be something kind of like, you know, kind of lonely. But then in like, when I look back, I'm like, it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Seattle was high school? Uh, middle school, high school. Okay, and then you graduated high school and then went to Boston, Boston College or university? University. Okay, yeah. with a major in what? Graphic design and minor in art history. Okay, and in high school, you already knew that you wanted to do graphic design. That was like your set dream. I think I knew in middle school. Oh, really? Yeah, because I think, um, what was the project? I, you know, we used to do these projects where um, we have to do presentation. I think it was like my science class or something. We had to make like all these props and and visual like what to draw things charts and all these things to like explain you know do the presentation in front of your class yeah. i don't i loved it so much like creating the presentation. creating things like doing the graphics how can i make this all this stuff another thing that i got into graphic design is all those fashion magazines i was reading in the la- public library mm-hmm. vogue and everything i because because seattle was it wasn't the same place back then it was like really you know the industry wasn't really like booming as is now yeah that was a beginning of starbucks like a small town sort of. exactly yeah. it's the beginning of amazon and all those big corporates yeah so um like you know like it, it was a dingy city it was kind of you know like economy wasn't like it was all right yeah. and you know it's just weather's always gray and rainy and mm-hmm. stuff and i used to look at those fashion magazines and think like man like what is this world <laughs> right like you know i gotta go to new york were you i don't know why but like it was all about yeah that was it exactly were you more in love with the fashion or the graphics both okay because i didn't like i was like looking at those images thinking like who are these beautiful people they look so happy yeah and like how can i work like i want to be there right (laughs) and then you know in my like young mind i was just kind of like i mean i don't i didn't think like designing fashion or jewelry was something that i wanted to do mm-hmm. it's just that the picking of the magazine and reading it i was just like hey i want to do something like this yeah were you already dressing like in middle school and high school like different than other people yeah really yeah. i was like i um yeah and I, I don't think i ever blended in really yeah okay and then why did you pick like boston out of curiosity why not FIT or something like that? Uh, it's because I did get into like, you know, a few colleges and I did get accepted. Uh-huh. And, you know, I did get into NYU too. Oh. What was the reason for Boston? I knew I wasn't going to study if I go to New York. Oh, so you're protecting yourself from New York City. I wasn't protecting, I was being real. And, and then, oh, besides that, BU gave me full scholarship. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so awesome. I was being practical reason. I'm a okay. pretty practical person. <laughs> Did uh did your parents support your idea of being like a graphic designer? They were cool with it? I don't think they I mean, you know, in general, like my mom, I you know, she wanted to study art all her life. Mm-hmm. So she did go to school for it, but she couldn't pursue it mm-hmm. because her family business like, you know, my grandpa like messed up the business. So they, you know, like they went bankrupt, there are all those issues. So um 
she got married early because mm-hmm. she felt like that was the first like, the right thing to do yeah. as a daughter and it just kind of like you know what I mean follow the Asian path yeah, exactly <laughs> so she really installed in my head like from really young you know as a woman yeah. like you know all this stuff is great too but make sure you do what you love oh good and i you know it's good to like have your job have your time and all this stuff mm-hmm. like it was really installed in me from like when i was really young yeah although she did the asian mom thing by like you know really showing me how to cook and all these things uh-huh. and making sure that you know i help put out and on the side all these things but yeah i think that that like that side of mom like um, help me to be who I am. Yeah. yeah, and dad was a military army guy. Yeah, was very he, strict. Did like, he understand the, the art dog. world? No, he. I didn't <laughs> know until like you know he told me he wanted to be a journalist. Oh, like he wanted to be in that media, uh-huh. and he didn't pursue it. I just didn't know why. Mm. He, like you know, but um, yeah. So there was no reservations about graphic design they no. were sort of supportive no they were very open okay, i think good. it wasn't like one of those asian parents like you have to become doctor or yeah, lawyer. yeah like it wasn't that they were just like as long as like you know you you know make living and you're mm-hmm. not going to be hungry <laughs> mm-hmm. like you know it's yeah. just make sure you do well right. like you know and then so at boston is when you met your soon-to-be husband yeah verbal who at the time was not a musician yet right like verbal is now a, like a well-known musician but back then he was like uh, no, actually, he was doing music okay. when he was young and in high school. But um, I guess his parents didn't want him to do music because, mm-hmm. you know, being the, being the typical Asian parents, they just thought that... That's not a real career. Yeah, you're not going to make any money, like <laughs> right. go to college, be something else. Yeah. So he, I guess like he did get record contract when, in high school, but oh. he didn't get it. He oh. didn't... Take it. Take it. Okay. So he dropped it, went to high school, I mean, college... And I think one of the um, summer breaks, he went back home and, and he was just helping out his friend who was making demo tape, mm-hmm. which just became the um, one member of the M-Flow now. Yeah. And that was he, during Boston? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he but was it, already quite big in in Japan, but while going to He college. was starting to get big, I guess. Yeah. But like, I didn't really pay attention in Jap- like what's going on in Japan. Right. Because, I mean, like, it's, you know, it's not like back then, you know, it wasn't like like how do I say it? like instantly you can check things out like yeah. you know so you have to <laughs> right. kind of hear from other or people go there. Yeah. go there to really yeah. see what was going on so yeah I mean it was just like I I, I knew it was blowing up but like I didn't know the yeah. extent how big it was right, right. yeah okay and I, and I wasn't really following Asian pop back mm-hmm. then so I mean right. I still don't really in a way yeah. but like um, yeah so what were your influences in like you know what are you listening to what are you watching on TV are you like full on listening to only like hip hop and R&B like American no I got into hip hop and R&B more at, um, in Boston because uh-huh. there's so much it's like a lot of my friends came from New York and mm-hmm. for them it was all about that yeah. that's how I got introduced to more hip like you know that genre okay. I think from college not that I wasn't really listening to it before but mm-hmm. Seattle was definitely it was a different city so, oh yeah and yeah. Seattle has its own crazy music scene yeah yeah. yeah. so you were like into then, indie yeah. rock and stuff yeah okay cool I was like an emo kid oh okay <laughs> Nirvana and <laughs> yeah, Pearl Jam I mean, who didn't yeah, yeah exactly like all this the, the sub pop and like you know right. that like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so what about like movies and TV and stuff you're watching all like American stuff I was, but I was more into like really local, like college, like programs, like, you know, like the more local scene of like, you know, like they used to have these, all these like random programs in the middle of the night, like talking about indie movies and all those things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was like always into something that was off, not major. Yeah. So like for me, it was more interesting to dig into those things, like collecting like, um, like, uh, local newspapers and like college, like university, like like downtown and all these different areas and I was like reading like, like zines yeah and zines like and all this stuff uh-huh. reading about like what's going on and I was underage so I can go to these places yeah. but just I loved reading about it and like like right. you know checking them out on like radios and like TVs and all that yeah. stuff yeah. did you finish Boston? Uh, did I finish Boston? yeah did you graduate? Uh, yeah of course okay so you graduate and then you're thinking I'm gonna go to New York make it to the Big Apple finally right that was like your sort of next step that's intention. what I thought I was gonna yeah. do but I mean it's not as easy as you know it's like your your wish is one thing but reality is another thing okay so I ended up working in a graphic design firm in Boston doing like very corporate stuff which one? 
like um it was like a small design firm but you know we had clients like all the local hospitals uh-huh. we I, they were doing something for harvard like business school so mm-hmm. it was like very like stiff like yeah. graphic design kind of thing but even that you know like it, it taught me because i learned how to um like manually create visuals for companies like standards and stuff like exactly because right? yeah. it's quite you know like that's what i learned for, i think that stage when i was working there right and I think that comes through in your work now. Mm-hmm. There's definitely like a graphic designer's eye on everything that you do now, you know? Yeah. And it's like very sort of like, um, I don't know if the right word's clean, but it's like you could tell that someone knew the rules of graphic yeah. design I'm, I'm, and I'm making like, this. Yeah, I get really tedious about even like the type yeah. kerning and like all that stuff. People get like, what? But I'm like, no, trust me, you're <laughs> missing like one point right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so verbal convinces you at, at the time you're working at this graphic design studio is that when he convinces you right around then yeah because because i was i was bored yeah i was like you know you're young and you're like i want to do something creative like mm. i want to do this and that and he was just like well new york's okay but just come out tokyo because back then you know tokyo was booming yeah it was a lot of creative stuff yeah what year is this it was like um early it was like 2003 four ish okay. yeah so i was like i guess had you been there before Mm, once okay yeah and he was already getting his career off the ground at this yeah, point yeah course, okay yeah. so i mean was he like you don't have to worry i'm going to take care of you i mean he did yeah i mean because i mean going to another country not being able to speak the language totally all this stuff it's just like scary it is scary yeah yeah but i mean even that like you know it did take me like a few years to learn japanese and be um where i was but me when i was you know the fact that I moved around so much when I was young, like yeah, it uh, it was oh, you're comfortable yeah. to yeah, just pack just, up and go. Yeah. You were used to it, yeah. And I, I I can just pick it up instantly. Were you thinking, and maybe you and Verbal, were you guys thinking like this was a temporary stopover until a short move? I, like I wasn't thinking too deep. I was just kind of like, let's see. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And then like I never, I I didn't even think I was gonna be doing what I was doing back then. Right. I was just looking for something to do and probably graphic design right yeah yeah but even that it's like not easy because i don't i couldn't speak the language mm-hmm. so what can i do it's like just find job that whatever i can around me right yeah and the one of the first things i started doing was just helping out with the styling mm-hmm. um it's because like even back then like the genre of hip-hop was quite i think new to japanese market yeah. so it was you know, like um, premature, like it was early. It looked like early days of New York hip hop. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they. I mean, they. I think their understanding is just that, and it was like stuck, right? right? So whenever there was like something going on, they would, you know, we would ask for um, clothes or you know whatever. They'll just still bring like Fugu jerseys and mm-hmm. all this stuff, and we're extra like, are you large, serious? Large, yeah, you're right. like seriously, like really. Uh-huh. And and we used to get so upset, so we. Um, I mean, I never, I, I don't know anything about styling, but I knew what he liked. Yeah. So like, we were like, give me, give us the budget. We'll mm-hmm. just go get what he, he want to wear. Yeah. And just let that be mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, like, I don't think, I didn't believe that that because maybe because I I come from a more listening to rock background, I didn't the artists on stage should be the same as off stage. Okay. You, you shouldn't know? have a costume. Exactly. Right, right. It's very easy for a young creative, especially one who finds themselves in a new environment, to just, you know, go with the flow. To say, hey, this is the way it's been done, so let's just go with it. I don't want to rock the boat. What's really cool about Yoon is that she took her roots of indie rock and Seattle, and here she is now sitting in an uber machismo hip-hop world in Tokyo, and she's saying, nah, we ain't doing it the old way. We're doing something different. This takes a ton of courage. The courage to not forget where you came from and speak up for what you think is right. So for me, it was just like, I knew he had the eccentric side and mm-hmm. he liked all this like fashion brands, yeah. right? Like Dior Ohm and like, you know, Raph Simmons and all those mm-hmm. things. Why wear FUBU when you go on stage? Exactly. Right? <laughs> I mean, this is early 2000, yeah. like three, four. They didn't get the concept of it because right. they still thought that rapper is supposed to look like something. Yeah, yeah. But we're like, no, we'll wear what he likes to wear. And that... Yeah, I think he's like, it's funny, like, you know, now high fashion is something infused so well with hip hop, but mm-hmm. like, he was already doing all that stuff 
being himself. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was like no one was telling him he wanted to wear those skinny Dior cut. Like, you know, remember right. Eddie Slimming making all this like skinny Dior almost stuff? Yeah. That's what he was performing in because right. he felt most himself in that, not okay hip hop. So you acted as a stylist essentially. Not well, really just like I would say, I wouldn't say, I don't want, I don't know. I, that kind of gives me cringy to say I'm like <laughs> stylist, but I'm like, I just helped him out. Okay. Yeah, because he didn't have to go get the clothes. So I was just like, I knew what he liked. Right. It's easy for me to just go get it than having to explain to someone, I'm like, listen, that's what he's looking for kind of thing. Yeah. And so how do you now, because I remember before Ambush, yeah. you had um, Antonio Murphy Astro, right? Yeah, that's just a, one of those things that Verbal was just kind of, you know, you know, like that's when that, you know, he started to make jewelry for fun because, you know, it was like, it was in, remember, like all yeah. this, like everybody, Boring like and, Nigo yeah. and like Pharrell, Chains exactly. Yeah. So he was just making a few, like, jewelries for himself for, um, stage and, uh -huh. you know, whatever. Like, and, and, um, we, we just knew few people could actually do fine jewelry. Mm -hmm. So we uh, asked, commissioned them. We, we had idea sketches and everything, and we just asked them to make us those pieces. Mm -hmm. And then it just got, um, got blown. <laughs> well, what was the, do you remember like the first time where it kind of became something other than verbal and you guys making stuff just for verbal? Like, was there an order? Was there a request from someone that was like, oh, wow, this is something bigger now? I think that the, the pow, like the knuckle ring that he yes. made for fun, I think that was a s genesis of it. Because he made that, that got a lot of attention. Because no one was doing like really pop graphic mm -hmm. fine jewelry back then. Mm -hmm. So that, that caught a lot of attention and people wanted to make, they wanted to buy, but of course I can buy like, you know, a huge piece like that. Yeah. So um, like we were like, why don't we make it just smaller one? Mm -hmm. And then why don't we just ring. yeah let's just coat them in like neon colors because we're both so into neons I don't know why mm -hmm. and then like that was the genesis and I remember just Kanye picked it up because he used to come a lot for teriyaki boys mm -hmm. and then you know like that was a start okay so. I mean I didn't even think we weren't even thinking about doing brands we yeah. just made it give it out to friends for fun uh -huh. and then it just that's when like buyers were like we need to have it okay after kanye wore it i mean we i mean verbal was already big so yeah. people wanted it but like kanye kanye wearing that we got that from overseas mm -hmm, buyers mm -hmm. like right. sarah from colette yeah. calling and like you know i remember that from yeah. like rsvp and like all these different people we we're like uh what is going on uh-huh okay yeah where were you making these in japan, japan. everything japan everything still. japan yeah. still okay so you just knew some jewelry makers that you could commission yeah. to do this yeah okay um were you read like after orders were being placed who was taking care of like the logistics of you know like how we do you get know. people to pay no like one... make an invoice like open we, a bank like... account <laughs> how are you doing this i'm honestly like you know we we were just like no one taught us any uh -huh. of this stuff we're just doing it like just we're literally packing and shipping out of our own house mm -hmm. And, you know, Verbal was talking to them directly yeah. in person about, like, you know, taking orders and all those things. Right. And I was just more dealing with this, the dealing, you know, the cre like, I, I don't want to say the creative side, but I'm just talking to factories and make sure everything's turning out okay. okay. Yeah. So we kind of split the roles that way. Right, right. But Verbal was actually taking the orders from people? Yeah. That's insane. And you guys were just packing it out of your home? Yeah. Like, literally, like, back then, there was a huge, you know, that was, the, you know, like, it was, like, around 2009, 10-ish, like, um... There was a, like a huge like electro boom in Japan, so we used to DJ a lot because uh -huh. we used to actually throw a lot of parties locally, right. and there was like new merging scene coming out, and like it, it was it was like a fun time for clubs. I think mm -hmm. it was just everything was popping off, and so you know we would be out until six in the morning because it would actually throw all this whole bunch of parties, and yeah. then like we'll come back and I wish we'll be actually packing so we can take it out next like that morning so wow. we could get to the store. Wow. Yeah. This is pre like e-commerce too, like before. Yeah, like yeah. people, like how did they place the order? Like just phone calls and emails. Email. Yeah. Yeah. So it was all done through email. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, okay, so when did the name Ambush come? Ambush actually, we had it for a bit. I think we verbal got the name around two thousand three or four, mm -hmm. and he got that name because he just thought that you know why not 
in this he, I, I let that name up to him mm-hmm. and he just thought that um ambush your name was like it was perfect because we could just kind of release things whenever we feel like and ambush mm-hmm. people okay so like seriously we weren't thinking about doing like let's do a brand right like a jewelry brand yeah he's like let me a celebrity so we're gonna do and it was just literally we're just like making things we didn't know when where it was going Uh but people wanted it so they want to order it we're like okay we'll just make some and deliver it to you yeah and things were just accumulating and escalating so around 2012 we're like if you're gonna do this like we should do it like as a brand Mm -hmm. actually like present it like we didn't even know buying season or anything (laughs) so we'll be like like random month like we'll be like hey guys we made some new pieces you want to buy it and all the buyers will be like oh it's not buying season so we can just pull out budget you know like which i didn't even know yeah and then we start to figure out okay there's a buying season there's Uh a thing called summer spring and winter fall and like all these things we're like okay let's just do this like thoroughly Mm -hmm. with the collection like two times a year Uh and then we can show it as Tenji guy and like all this stuff. That was 2012 and that's when we right. started to structure it more. There's a big lesson here. Yoon and Verbal had no idea what the hell they were doing. They didn't know about ordering seasons, buying budgets, taking orders, shipping orders, or getting paid. They knew they wanted to get their product out and it was the urgency of that above everything else that made Ambush happen. So often I hear great ideas great concepts and great brands just never get off the ground because the founders were too distracted about something that they weren't sure about. And in reality, you're never going to have the answers for everything. And if you wait to find out all those answers before you begin, the ship will very likely set sail without you on board. Take the plunge, otherwise you'll never know. And is it still just the two of you? It's still two of us. Okay. Did you ever bring in any partners when you wanted to be more, like, structured now? No, like, I mean, now, like, we, you know, partner with, like, you know, some people help us with, you know, different aspects. Mm -hmm. Like, you need that. Mm -hmm. There's so much you can do alone because I don't know everything. And Verbal doesn't know everything. Mm -hmm. So you do need help from, like, you know, other different people who are more expert at different things. But we, um, no, we were actually doing everything because we wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. We wanted to learn what it's like to actually deal with the stores, buy it, learn with the factories as well. Because unless you know what you're doing, you cannot leave it up to other people and you cannot lead other people to do the right thing. Yeah, you don't know how to do it. Exactly, you have to become a student first and Mm -hmm. then sometimes you have to learn from your mistakes. And I think it's quite important in the beginning stage of business Mm because unless you know what's right for you, like you cannot get to that right place. Do you have employees now? Of course, yeah. How many employees do you have now? We have um, about 12 people now. Okay. Yeah. And you have a, a storefront as well, yeah. like a sort of workshop slash gallery yeah. slash. because we have a studio right upstairs and then downstairs is a sh- store. Okay. Yeah. And then so between, you have 12 people, they all work in that studio? Uh, Yeah. Okay. Can you break down like what the people do? Upstairs there's me, there's Verbal, but Verbal also does, you know, different work, not mm-hmm. just Ambush. That's, Ambush is the main thing he yeah. does, you know, he's involved in different entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. So, like me, Verbal, and then there's an accountant, we have a production guys, like four of them sitting on this side. Next to my side would be, um, like, admin people, two of them, and then two interns. Mm-hmm. And then we have four... Um, shop stuff downstairs Mm -hmm. and then that's we operate everything okay how hands-on are you with like um you know understanding you have to make this much amount of money every month or like rent and payroll like do you have like a firm understanding of all that or do you leave it to the accountants i do i like they need to report to me every day does it ever stress you out or get scary that like yeah because like fashion or anything creative is like you know it's you think it's just all easy and fun just creating things but at the end of the day like fashion is just like making candles or whatever you mm. make things and you sell it yeah. if you don't sell it you cannot do the next thing right so i mean it's not the money but for me what what makes me kind of excited and um is like understanding what product moves with our customers mm. Certain things that I thought I was so confident, like, oh, this is going to do so well in the collection, but they react to something else. Mm-hmm. 
maybe I was just too thinking artistically. Yeah. So I need to pull my head out and be like, hey, maybe no. But I think customers want something much more simpler. Right. That's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. I'm just learning the balance of it. Yeah. So. Me getting those reports doesn't stress me out so much, but it's just it actually helps me clear to understand what people want versus exactly. what you want. Yeah. Do you find that sometimes your favorite thing is like the worst performing thing, and vice versa? Like your least favorite piece is like the best selling thing. Yeah, but even that is a balance too, because you need to have creative like show pieces to tell the story of the collection. Yeah. But you know, but. People, not many people are bold enough to wear those things mm-hmm. or but carry this. They get you this. depressed and notoriety. Yeah, but so, they're the they want a piece of something which ends up becoming much simpler ones. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it also that helps me to design it in a way that that I make this piece, but what element of that I can make it into something that everyone can own. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the challenges that when you first started to become a company, right? Um, and you decided like we're gonna get on calendar, we're gonna have a collection and everything. What were some of those immediate like, oh shit, like we didn't think about this stuff, like learnings? Um, managing people. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the hardest. Because it was two of you for so long and you guys did everything, right? So now oh, not, it's, it's not about that. It's like, it's not about like, you know, delegating wasn't the thing. It's okay. just that it's hard to find people and train them to understand your vision mm-hmm. and what you want to do. And it takes such a long time to do that. And by the time you do that, it sometimes... It works so well with the people. Sometimes, no matter how much you invest in your time training them, they don't get it. Right. That, you know? that can definitely no. happen. And so you wasted I, all your time. I won't say wasted. I just, I like, I mean, yeah, at that moment, I'm like so pissed. Like, I'm just kind of like, what the F was that for? But sometimes you have to go through that to find the right people too. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just look at human relationships. Like, it's like, um, like there's a Japanese word called N, which N means like it's kind of like if it's meant to be meant to be if it's not it's not you know you can't that's it N just means that it's like it's kind of like I don't it's kind of like a destiny okay yeah fate. yeah fate yeah yeah okay and I think finding the right employees are like that too are you good at delegating yeah I don't like to micromanage people okay if they're good I let them do things if they make, if they make a mistake I get on it but I'm not I don't I'm not the type who overlooks their shoulder and be like what are you doing. Mm. Cause, but they also need to prove to me that, that they can do it well first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You seem like a... I f- feel like you're a micromanager, though. Because I, I feel like you know like, I'm a, everything. I'm a good field marshal. I notice I can read... If I walk into the room, yeah. I can read everything and I can pick out exactly who's not doing... Uh-huh. Who's doing something right. Right. I right. Can, give me like two minutes, I can read uh-huh. everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, just in the in the five minutes that I spent walking over from your booth here... I saw you delivering chocolates, asking your assistant what's going on, seeing Kevin about his appointment. Uh, he's saying he already took care of it, but you, already, you knew he had an appointment. Someone holding a piece, and you're like, why are you holding that piece in a place that it shouldn't be? That was all like literally in like three minutes from when we walked out of your booth. And I'm like, this girl like is on top of every, like there's nothing getting past you. I mean, I, guess <laughs> I have to. <laughs> It's, it's commendable. It's yeah. really commendable. I think a lot of business owners, especially who get like, you know, a lot of um, notoriety and fanfare, yeah. they tend to start to like believe their own hype and like just let it go. You know, like it, they start to think like, oh, yeah, I don't I, I don't have to like be delivering chocolates to my booth or like, you know, Why? Because... Well, don't you want to take care of your employees? And no, I'm just saying nice some people like, oh, <laughs> you're so nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, but some people get, you know, bigger and, you know, then then their head is actually, in, you know, going on. Like, they, they head gets big and they just, like... Don't forget, people work basics. for you. They give you time and you can't do everything alone. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, like, that's something that everyone has to realize that, like, it's not you. It's just that you have idea, you're the head. Like, if you if you look at it as, like, human body, if it's company, you might be the head but and the heart. Yeah. But there's other parts of the body that needs to function with you. Right. And those are your employees, as so you have to take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with Yoon here. As an individual, there is only so much you can do with your day. There was a time where I got really obsessed with time management. I started breaking down minutes I'd be awake, asleep, using the bathroom, eating, commuting, etc. And every second wasted would drive me crazy. I'd obsess about which subway car to stand on in order to reduce the commute by seconds. 
It got to the point where I hit maximum efficiency. Every minute in a 24-hour day was being utilized to its fullest potential. What the fuck do I do now? This is where the team matters most. It allows you to go beyond what a mere mortal can do in one day. And your ability as the founder to delegate and manage that team will ultimately be the deciding factor in whether your business succeeds or fails. So now that you have this sort of like established company with employees, what are some immediate challenges that you have now? Um, manpower, I guess, because my ambition is quite big. <laughs> I think um, I need to learn. That's something that I always tell myself to kind of slow down a little bit, not slow down in a way that, OK, everyone, you know, stops. But it's just that I'm in a privileged place where I can travel a lot and see great things. but not my employees because they have to stay in one place to take care of their stuff mm -hmm. so i can come back and share all these great stories of something that i just saw but they're not gonna get that yeah that so i can be over ambitious and be like yo we gotta do this and we gotta do all that stuff but like they will not get it mm -hmm. right so uh, what i mean by slow down is that like i like there's a one thing to be excited about where i want to go but also like they're you know it's just they're not going to be moving quick as a as I want them to, yeah. but I need to have patience mm -hmm. and also make sure that the, you know, I teach them enough that they, they will believe in my vision mm -hmm. without knowing it. They will invest their emotions in that. Right. Yeah. So, that's what I'm, and also, um, I don't know if manpower is the right word for that, but yeah, like I think that's the biggest <laughs> challenge is okay. making sure that that the great things I I've, I've seen that I want to put into shape. Mm -hmm. They'll trust me and they'll follow me with it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have, um, can you, you said you're a good field general. Can you sense when someone's not getting it like right away? Absolutely. It's like a vibe, right? Yeah. Like you just sort you of feel it. it. Yeah. yeah. And then what do you, so what's your solution when you, when you face something like that? Are you like, do you face it head on? Or are you the type of person that just, let's have a conversation and just sit down and like figure this out? Or are you the type that sort of lets it play itself out naturally? Depends what their role is. Mm. If it's production, I'm not going to let them just play out. That's just going to mess it up and yeah. it's going to cost me money. <laughs> right, right. But um, it depends. Mm. If, if they, if, I think it's in their attitude as well. If they don't understand it, yeah. and, but they're willing to understand it, I'm going to have more patience about it. Mm -hmm. But some people just don't open up as quick. Yeah. Their hearts just shut. Right. And I know when, that's when they're supposed to go. They're not yeah. fit for this company. Have you had to fire people? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. It, you sound like you've done it a lot. I don't. We can't fire legally in Japan. Oh, no. Yeah. So yeah, we have fire. to find a way to like draw them out of the company. <laughs> make their lives miserable yeah. and make them quit. Base is that what you have to do? Make them quit? Um, I can't make them quit, but you kind of you know you know I I don't make people quit. But I have my standards. If you can't meet it, I like I'll make it pretty clear to them that they're not doing their job. Okay, is that something you dread doing, or you're fine with firing people? I don't dread it because at the end of the day, like I look at it like, like we had issues with a lot of production people. I mean, deadlines, deadline, and I need to meet mm -hmm. and I need to deliver. I mean, for me, it's just like a simple solution. It's just if you can't do that, then you should be here because mm -hmm. it's it's, it's going to cost me like not just financially, but like my relationship with and the, with clients. Yeah. You know, it's right. not worth. Right. Yeah. Man, ice cold. You have to be, though. You have to. I think you have to be really clear about those yeah. situations. I hate firing people. It's like I dread it. I hate having that conversation. I. <laughs> Legally, we can't fire people in Japan. So I never <laughs> okay. fired anyone. <laughs> um, tell me some um, pros and cons of having a business with your significant other. I think finding time. Yeah. How do you separate personal and business? Or is there no separation? It's, 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 it's all like mingled up. Yeah. Yeah. We just have to find a way to like mentally draw the line, I think. Uh -huh. Like we try not to talk about work at home, but you can help it because it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. And because creative work, so you can't just be like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, like I'm done. It's right. like you constantly have to like think about it and you have to think about what's going to happen next day and all this stuff. So um, yeah, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. I think we just have to really like draw the line and be like, okay, don't pick up the phone during dinner. Let's not think about this like on Sundays or, you know, you know what I mean? You just have to really draw the line like, 
we're not gonna talk about like you know you know what I mean yeah yeah after a certain hour let's just not talk about work let's talk about something other than work mm -hmm. yeah right right um, you are uh, a minority in in many different ways right so obviously you're a minority Asian you're a minority because um, you're a Korean in Japan so you're a minority in that aspect mm -hmm. you were a minority in America like you've never been in a situation where you were like the norm, it seems like, you know, and being a designer in this world too is also very sort of like male driven, right? How do you navigate being like, you know, Asian American, female, Korean, living in Japan, not speaking your native language and doing all of this? Like, is that something that's constantly on your head, like in your mind? Yeah. It's a constant everyday struggle. Cause I wouldn't say the word struggle I know in the back of my head that I'm never going to be one of them. Yeah. I'm not. It's right. just... So, you're never going to be French. You're never going to be Japanese. You're never going to be no. male. <laughs> but there's a lot of advantage that I have they don't have. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd rather just... I don't want to dwell on that side, mm -hmm. but I just want to focus on like positive things that I have that they don't have. Mm -hmm. You know, like my bringing up, like we talked about it earlier, but like I can't instantly connect with anybody. <laughs> Because I grew up in so many different places and I've, I was exposed to so many different people. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I'm able to do what I'm doing right now. And also being able to come to Paris and do all this stuff without feeling awkward. Mm -hmm. Because like for me, it's just like, I don't know, like in a way that it was almost like training me to be where I am. Mm -hmm. Not only I can do what I can do. Yeah. So, but I mean, I do understand there are some times that I know no matter how much I can do, like I'm never going to be one of them. Mm -hmm. But but I think the world's really changing. Like there's so many different people coming from different backgrounds, working in different industry. Otherwise it was once ruled by a specific type of people. Yeah. So um, I think it's gonna be good. Like, do I you think. find that in Japan, because it's so traditional there, do you still feel blocks sometimes? Yes, there's a glass in me. Really? But you know what, it's okay. Because I think I, um, at the end, if you use, become successful, mm -hmm. they have to accept you. <laughs> <laughs> It's one thing to be naive to all the walls built around you. There's a certain peace to ignorance. Yoon, on the other hand, recognizes everything that's happening around her. She understands her position and the jockeying that is constantly happening. It's almost like being on a packed subway train, you know? You have to fight for your spot, but not in a way where you're like a bull in a china shop, but by standing firmly and confidently. Using this challenge as a motivation and a source of strength is one of the things that I respect most about Yoon. And she puts it best here. When you become successful, they have to accept you. And okay, so let's, that's a good transition because you're becoming very successful. You've always been successful, but I think in the last year you've been accredited with a lot of success from the sort of like um, the gatekeepers of the world, right? So like CFDA or Vogue are like sort of throwing you accolades. And a lot of people are like, wow, ambush Yoon, this like overnight success. But like you've been at it for 15-ish years at this point, right? How does it feel now that like you're finally getting recognition that is due? I don't really, I, I still feel like we're a young brand. Because, mm. you know, because we didn't, there was no like business guy like doing everything for us. Like everything, we're just still students. We're still learning as we do it. Uh -huh. I still don't know so much things about this like fashion system and all these things so no i'm like really like i, I really still feel like a student mm -hmm. in all aspects yeah. so yeah i mean years like, in, you're like no so yeah like like there's no such thing as overnight success overnight usually means like 10 years more <laughs> like in any small businesses i think that's i think a lot of people don't realize that yeah. another thing like when we're lvmh price like which i like Really, I'm so honored that they even like, you know, picked us up and be able to go to finalists among everybody who went to finest fashion school. Mm -hmm. I don't even have a training in fashion. Yeah. It's self-taught. Right. And I winter came to my booth during like semifinal um, competition. And then she was asking like, which school did you go to? I, to I told her I didn't go to school. Mm -hmm. I was like, I taught myself this. And she was like, you did pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I mean, still, I'm still learning. Right. So how much of is how much of it is skill versus luck? Because there's got to be some luck involved. You think you do you believe in luck? Uh, I'm asking you. I don't believe in luck so much. Mm, really? I think you just have to be prepped. So it's skill and hard work. Yeah. Okay. You always have to be ready. Okay. 
So I think being ready is always like making sure you always study, making sure that you believe in that that moment is going to come one day, mm. being prepared for that moment. Mm. And I think luck is that just timing. Right. But you have to be ready for yeah. when that luck comes. Yeah. Nothing like not there's I don't believe in luck like it's just by chance like, you know, like we're granted this. No. I think it's just being ready at the right time. Mm. And you don't know what that time is. Right. That's why you have to be ready. Mm. And to be ready, you just have to be like a student all the time mm. and always be on your toes. Yeah. Um, I have one last part. So I want to find out like about how you balance all your, let's just call it work. I'm not even talking about personal, yeah. but like your, you know, appearances and like you do shoots and, you know, you're here selling your latest collection and then there's designing the collection. And then there's like making sure your team is executing on that collection. Yeah. Right. How do you personally balance all of this? Uh, what do you mean by balance? Like, time? how do you, ju- yeah, like juggle it all? Like, like we're just on a constant schedule. How do you yeah. keep your schedule? Like, like I just, you I keep mean, it yourself. Do you have like 50 assistants that are like telling you? No, I don't have an assistant. You don't have one assistant. No. So you keep everything just like you know what you need to do. Yeah. And then do you ever feel like, it's not that I don't want an assistant. I'm oh, just she's hiring. <laughs> hey guys, like, she's no, hiring. No, it's just that, yeah. Like anyone who's capable of wanting to move to Tokyo, please apply. Like it's um, I you know like I just make sure like all, everyone's like prepped mm-hmm. in right. advance, yeah. and we just have a lot of head planning, and everything's count. We you know um right now I'm like making sure that everything is um prepped like year and a half. Nothing's going to happen exactly a year and a half, but it's good to have a general idea of where you want to go so that, that we can quickly adopt if something needs to be changed, mm-hmm. like not like monthly. Right. So yeah. right now we're in January 2018. You're already beginning to think about to next summer. 2019 summer. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you're pretty on top of things. Yeah. Okay. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you need, but you'd like an assistant that could help you with this. Yeah. yeah. But I think in order to do that also, um, um, they are, yeah, but I think I'm going to find good people. I, like, you know, some of the stuff I have up there, like they all come from, they don't come from fashion background. Mm. I had a girl who worked at Google and she came, I hired her because like she, when she came for an interview and I told her what her position was and I told her like, you know, people often think about fashion as like something like champagne and parties, but I'm, I'm letting you know it's going to be a lot of grunt work. Mm-hmm. Like, and if you are okay with that, then you're more than welcome to work here. And she said, I quit Google because I want a more challenge. So I was like, okay, if you think we're going to be more challenged than Google, then welcome. And she's like the best. Wow. Yeah. What are some interview tips? Like if you're, if someone's interviewing with you, what should they have prepared? You know, I used to like trying to, I, I, you know, I kind of, there's an inferiority. I used to think like, oh, if, if they come from fashion background, they're going to know more than me. Like, you know, if they worked at certain fashion companies and all this stuff, but, and this is all bullshit. People lie on resume. So <laughs> don't, it's more than the name of where they used to work, I would really recommend to test their EQ. What's EQ? Like, you know, I'm more than IQ. Uh-huh. What I mean by EQ is at the end of the day, like I'm spending more time with them than anybody, right? Because yeah. I'm there with them almost like 12 hours each day because we work a lot. Right. We all have to be able to like read each other and understand each other. Mm-hmm. It's not just knowledge here. Yeah. It's all human relationship. Okay. And that dynamic makes everything happen. So it's more important that they that they vibe with you, like their personality and their emotions vibe yeah. with you than their intelligence and academics or resume. Because you can always learn. Right. And also like people who have the right mindset and mm-hmm. who's willing, teaching is easy. Mm-hmm. It's a skill. You just yeah. learn it. Yeah. But, but some people are just... If they don't have the personality to, who are not, who's not a team player, mm-hmm. who doesn't know how to like, like um, socialize, you cannot teach that at a certain age. Right, right. So no. Okay. All right. There's some advice for you if you want Yoon's assistant job. <laughs> <laughs> Any last bits of advice that you want to give to people who are starting out? I mean, you must get asked all the time, like, how do I, how do I do what you do? What is, what is like some sage advice you give to young people? You know, there's no such thing as like quick success. You really have to work hard. Like even, you know, maybe, you know, I, I don't even think we're successful. Some people say we are, you guys are doing so well and all this stuff. But like, I still look at myself 
and compare myself to people who are much much better than me and I see how much more we need to go um and I still go to the office like seven in the morning and then come out at 1 a.m every single day because I have to overlook every part of the business and this is just cold fact mm -hmm. like you think about like designing people often think like oh it's like creative I just you know come up with ideas no designing real designer for me it means you're designing every aspect of the company it's not just the visuals but how you want to run the company um company model how do you want to do the sales and everything and those things take time so if you want to do it be willing to commit not just with your word but with like mind mm -hmm. and physically yeah. and to make sure you put that to shape and don't take it lightly yeah. okay good advice all right thank you very thank much thank you <laughs> that was awesome hey thanks for listening you can find out more about the show and listen to other episodes at hypebeast.com slash radio and you can subscribe to us wherever you listen i personally use overcast and you can reach out to me on twitter at jeff staple please do that i love hearing your comments Check us out on the web at businessofhype.com and you can email any questions you might have to questions at businessofhype.com. The Business of Hype is directed by Daniel Nevetta. It's edited and produced by Bright Young Things. You can check them out at byt.nyc. It's engineered by Patrick Morris and the great Nathaniel Reynolds Tingley III. This was recorded at Sibling Rivalry Studio and on location in Paris, France. I am Jeff Staple, and you've been listening to The Business of Hype on Hypebeast Radio.